Hello, this is Lessons of the 60s. Today is May 10th, 19, or excuse me, 2019. My name is Ann Gallivan. I'm part of the project, and today we are interviewing at the Institute for Policy Studies. We'll be interviewing Steve Clark. Steve is a local anti-war activist who's best known in Washington, D.C. as the founder of Stone Soup, a cooperative store that's, that sold organic food and employed many community members for the years of its existence, 1973 to 76. Steve, thanks for coming to see us today. Um, tell us how you uh, uh, landed in Washington. Okay, thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> and I'd be happy to tell you the stories. Yeah. Um, well, I, I was a uh, military brat. Uh, my father's in the Air Force, so when I was a little kid in the 50s, mm -hmm. we were moving around every year or two when I was a little kid. And then, we started to stay in a little bit longer, but we moved frequently. So I'd say my, my upbringing, you know, as a white male boomer in the 50s was like pretty much everybody like there was a white male boomer, except that being in the military, we moved around a lot. And I know that influenced me a lot because I saw, I ended up living in a lot of different places and having to relate to new people. And I saw how, I think I just from that ingrained that, you know, people are all different and you got to work with them all. I mean, you've got to keep going as a kid, no matter what. you got to make friends or whatever you're going to do. So that was my experience growing up. And then uh, in, uh, I guess, in, it's because my dad was in the Air Force and I went to high school out in Colorado uh, to one of his assignments, I was interested in going, being in the Air Force too. It was sort of like, well, be like your dad. So I applied to join the Air Force go to the Air Force Academy and was admitted. And I did go to the Air Force Academy for two years, but this was like 1965 to 1967, and the world was changing a lot. Mm -hmm. And even I, by the time I graduated from high school in 65, I was already kind of doubting on this military thing, but my father was in it, and so I did. I went to the Air Force Academy, and I ended up staying for two years, but uh, it just really, the war was heating up. I, it wasn't so much like I was anti-war. I didn't know enough to really be against it, but I could, I just didn't, I wasn't feeling it. And so... Uh, you couldn't find your own place in it. I couldn't see how I could be in the, in the Air Force doing what they do. It just didn't matter that much to me to do it. So why do that? So I was like, I'm going some, I'm getting out. And in those days, you, it was fairly easy to resign from the academies. And it's not that easy today. Um, so I did get out, and I ended up going to New York. Uh, I was going to go to uh, Columbia. I got admitted to Columbia. I went there. Had never been in a big city before. I was there for about a week trying to get registered for classes. And I said, man, how am I going to make this? I cannot handle this. And so I decided not to go to Columbia. <laughs> I went back to Ohio and stayed with my mother. My dad was over in Vietnam at the time. And I uh, stayed with my, my mother for a few months, and then I got admitted to Georgetown. So I ended up coming to DC to go to Georgetown. And I got here in January 1968, uh -huh. which was quite a year, 1968, particularly in Washington. Yes. Um, you might remember. Yes. Um, you, you came in Washington at the beginning of the really frantic year, um, but you got here just about the same time, or just a little before Martin Luther King was assassinated. Talk about that a little bit. Sure. What that was like being here then? Well, um, when I came in January, of course it was winter, it was cold, I was at Georgetown the first time in this city, and I got a room, assigned a roommate, and he dropped out of school right away, so I was living by myself, didn't know anybody, wasn't really sure how to make my way in the city, honestly. And, uh, but I was starting to feel like I didn't really like the way this war was going, and Johnson, uh, on March, in March. March 30th. March 30th yeah. that year. Based on pressure from uh, Gene McCarthy and others, anti-war movement, he announced he wasn't going to run for president. And I was home in my dorm, sitting in the TV room, when he came on and made this announcement. And I was just spontaneously drawn to go down to the White House and cheer. But so that was the first big anti-war thing you did. That was the first big, thing I ever did. And there was to. just thousands of people there. Yeah. And I don't, it wasn't any called event. Yeah. People just showed up because they were happy about him getting out and we were didn't like him anyway and we wanted to jeer him at the same time. It was happiness. It was an uplifting moment right at the beginning of <laughs> right. 
a, a bad year. Uh, a few days after that, Martin Luther King was assassinated in Memphis. And, and then, let's tell them about your job interview. Coincidentally, I was new in town and somebody had gotten, a cousin of mine had gotten me a job interview at this law firm that was downtown on K Street. And I was at Georgetown, as uh, people know DC, it's a pretty much straight shot from Georgetown straight in on M Street and then down K Street to downtown. And um, I had a job interview set up for the day that Martin Luther King was assassinated. And I didn't know that, of course, until I got out on the street, started going downtown. I mean, I had heard that we all heard the news, but when I, I, I didn't know when I got the interview set up, that's my point. Um, so when we all heard the news, I went out there, I was, still had to get to the interview, and I started walking downtown from Georgetown, and it was just, people were trying to get out of D.C. like crazy, and it was truly gridlock on all the streets. I remember thinking, this is so weird, I'm going to walk out in the middle of K Street. And I did that. And there's a walker went right between the middle of the cars. And I got to the law firm and I went upstairs and I told him who I was. And the woman came out who was going to do the interview with me. And she said, You got the job. Be here on Monday. We're all getting out of town. And they, and they just turned around and we all left. Right there. And the next day there was a curfew. So everybody that was in town had to stay inside. Had to stay inside. And then uh, I don't think they reopened businesses for at least a week or so. I, I don't remember exactly how long it took. And even after that, there were National Guard troops stationed on the different corners when I went yeah. back to work downtown. Um, but that was, that was a wild beginning to that year. And then later, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. The Democratic Convention was in Chicago that year, and there was all those demonstrations. And then the trial of the Chicago 8 came out of the police mm -hmm. attacks and everything that went down in Chicago. It's quite a year, and that was my first year out of the Air Force Academy, out of sort of my <laughs> naive childhood into the real world in D.C., and wow, it was an eye opener. Okay, so you became some sort of an anti-war activist in these years, starting with the big crowd at the White House, um, and a couple of years later you decided to form a cooperative, Stone Soup. But what happened in those intervening years before we get into the Stone Soup okay. story? Well, after I graduated from Georgetown, I had, uh, I had managed to get married and have a child in the intervening year and a half there, and then uh, I needed a job. So I didn't want to go to work for the government, particularly because I was an growingly anti-war, and, and I didn't want to work for any big corporation, even though my degree was in economics, because I was the corporations were the ones getting rich off the war. It just bugged me. So I ended up taking a job uh, under some government program where you could teach, if you taught, if you donated, te if you taught for a year, they would reduce your student loans um, from college. So I volunteered for that program and I ended up getting a job teaching in Southern Maryland uh, to a middle school, uh, teaching math. I had been an economics major and when I was at the Air Force Academy, I was an engineering major, so I had a lot of math. So they gave me a job teaching math. And so I taught there for a year. And of course, I was a terrible teacher um, because I hadn't been trained as a teacher. And I'm teaching middle school kids. And I, you know, I didn't even know I had to relate to I wasn't a very good teacher, but math is not that hard in, in another way. At the end of that school year was 1970. And on May 5th of that year uh, at Kent State, they killed five students who were protesting the war. And I had begun becoming more anti-war through the course of that year teaching. And when they killed those students, I felt like they were killing me. I really did. Yeah. I said, wow, you know, you can't go out and protest in this country anymore. They'll kill you. And I really did feel that way. And so it was on that day, really, that I said, I think it's going to take a revolution to change this. And so that's when I sort of self-declared as a revolutionary. I didn't really know what that meant exactly. But I had lost total confidence in the government, and I think that was a common was thing about for young the, people at that time. The demonstrations were about the invasion of Cambodia, and what a shock that was. I think, for some reason, people were shocked by that. It seemed totally logical to me that they would do that, but yeah. everybody was really very well, pissed off. Well, it took and the war to a new demos. level, yeah, because they, Cambodia was supposedly oh, yeah. a neutral country. Oh, yeah, it was really... Yeah. So that was a heavy time in 1970. Uh, Kent State the March, they had a march around the White House a, a week or so later, and the, they completely surrounded the White House with big, two layers of big, thick buses so yes. the marchers could be outside the buses. 
and they were all inside the fort in there. And uh, you know, they were they were scared of us, but we couldn't. You know, they were impenetrable in a certain sense too. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was a sense at that march after Kent State, I had a palpable sense of despair about what we could do. Mm -hmm. You know, it just really. Uh, I remember Bobby. I think his name was. Bobby, what was the, the black panther guy Seal. who was in this? Bobby Seal, Bobby thank Seal. you. Right. Um, I remember him speaking that day, and he was in you know, Washington. Fired, yeah. Okay. He was fired up and everything, and he was agitating and everything, but it just didn't offer a way out. It just, we were angry, we were frustrated, but it, it didn't give us a way to go. And so, yeah, that's where I was at. Uh, at that point, and I didn't want to teach anymore, so I got, I managed to get myself admitted to law school at George Washington University here in D.C., moved back in from Southern Maryland to the city with my wife and kid, and we started going to law school, and um, I was a radical at the law school, like, from the get-go, and the following spring they had um, May Day, where mm -hmm. they shut down the city with demonstrations. Were you part of that? That was a great day. I love that day. Uh, me and my friend from law school, we both got up early. We were out there about 5.30 in the morning with different groups going and blocking intersections and just as soon as the police would come you'd run and go around and block some other intersection until they couldn't, until they came there. I mean we really did make it difficult for business to go on as usual, which was the theme of the day. No business as usual. My friend and I, after several hours of doing that, we were back at the law school sitting on the porch steps about 10.30 in the morning, the police just came by and arrested everybody going down the street, threw us in a... You, you included? You were yeah, sitting we, on the we steps? Yeah, we both got arrested just sitting there. And uh, they took us out to those makeshift uh, jails fields they had around the RFK Stadium at the time. Were you one of the ones that stayed overnight in the, in the uh, stadium? No, I got admitted. I got uh, released later that day, but we were out there for... until like late in the evening. It took a while. Um, but anyway, after, after that, I don't know, I was just looking for a way to get, what is the way out, what is the way to make this revolution? How are we going to really change this thing? And my wife had gotten a job working at this buying club called Glut, which was a food co-op that worked out of a church in Georgetown mm -hmm. at the time. And now they have a, they even exist today, they have a storefront out in Maryland. Yeah. Somewhere. Um, Anyways, because of that, I was getting familiar with food co-ops, and we were living in a group house uh, on Q Street, and so we were buying our food and cooking it together, and so we, as a house, joined the co-op. And So uh, through her, I was learning a lot more about food co-ops and appreciating them, and my brother, who was on the West Coast, uh, was also into food co-ops, so I was getting positive feedback from him, and it just seemed like a great idea, but the idea... To really out-compete capitalism, you couldn't do it through food costs. You had to have a store. Uh -huh. You had to like have a real physical presence. You had to have a everyday availability. You had to provide real service, or else you could never. You were never going to make a dent in the capitalist way of doing things. This is the way I was thinking. So I said, we got to make a storefront. And so you know, I got a few people that were kind of in the co-op and thought it was a good idea, and we raised some money. We rented a. Uh, building and we renovated it. And it's a building on 18th Street. 18th and S. 18th and S, right? It had been a an abandoned. It had been a uh, laundromat mm -hmm. many years before, but hadn't been being used for years. Like look, look, and it was empty and abandoned, kind of. But uh, a lot of community people came and volunteered, carpentry services, all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. and uh, just people but, from the neighborhood. You mean when you yeah, started this? Story? Other alternative community types who had skills. Uh, mm -hmm. I know one guy, his kids were in the uh, free school where my kid went, and mm -hmm. he uh, was an electrician, so he did all the electrical work for Stone, so we had to rewire the whole building. And this would be about 72 or 73? It would have been summer of 73. Okay. Um, so, we got it going. Uh, over the summer, we just constantly were like renovating. By uh, mid-August or so, we were starting to feel like, oh, we're going to try and open this up and see what happens. We didn't really know that much, but because my wife had worked at Glut, she, actually she's continued to work at Glut, um, but Glut was a food co-op. They were used to buying. They, they 
had contacts with suppliers and so forth, so we were going to rely on them at first and, and then gradually develop our own relationships, and we did. So we opened up in September of 73, and it was thriving from day one. I mean, yeah, it was. Just Everybody went there. into that place went like crazy. I couldn't really believe it was good. how many people came in there. People loved it. It was a whole new idea of uh, so you food for people, not for profit. You, you saw that as kind of model, right? Mm -hmm. As of an model. alternative uh, way to do business in the food business. Explain okay. how the co-op aspect worked. Well, the, the, we called it a food co-op. And around the country, there's a lot of, the word is used loosely. Okay, so uh, in, in, in Glutton, in the buying clubs, part of being in the co-op was you had to do work. Like you had to go out and bag stuff up into smaller things, or you had to cut cheese from big blocks down into smaller and wrap and price it. Um, there's a lot of different kind of activities that you had to do in the buying clubs. So when we first started Sun Soup, we contemplated a lot of volunteers helping us make the store work. Mm -hmm. And so I, th I think we felt like it was a co cooperative in that sense. It was definitely nonprofit, but as time evolved, we realized that. I mean, you can, it's a lot of trouble organizing tons of volunteers for something that's going all the time like that. And we were, really weren't oriented to doing it, but mainly because we realized you couldn't do it. It would, it would just be diff extremely difficult. Plus, uh, we just thought it, like it'd be, it, was more, it would be more of a model of something that can work if you could employ people. Mm -hmm. Like, if you just have to get all the volunteers to work together, that's not a really a great model for how you could do the whole system different mm -hmm. and and we had that dream like somehow we were gonna like from these little things we were gonna make this revolution gain momentum and somehow down the road uh, what were the other co-op ventures at the same time as uh, stone soup was getting built up there were, wasn't there a soap collective and there was a bread collective were they all part of a pattern or did you meet with together with them? Was there an ideology around all this stuff? The Glut was the first thing and when uh, Glut had a thing in Georgetown and then they got a warehouse kind of storefront out in uh, Hyattsville or someplace in Maryland and because of uh, they had buying clubs all over the metropolitan area that worked in there through bought through their system. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry I'm forgetting the question. Bread co-op. Oh, the other bread entities. Yes. Yeah, the other. Yeah. <laughs> well, when when after after Stone Soup started, once we got Stone Soup started, we realized we needed uh, we needed a lot of things. We needed delivery. We needed to be able to store more stuff. And then Fields of Plenty wanted to open, and they were going to need more supplies. We needed a, a trucking collective to actually go to Baltimore two or three times a week, which was an overnight trip. You would leave around 11 o'clock at night, go up there and go to the different produce markets, fill up your truck, bring it back, and then deliver at the co-ops during the early morning. Um, so, but you had to do that. It was a grocery store. You, know, you had to be able to get fresh stuff in. So, so we had to have a food, uh, a trucking collector for that. We eventually had a baking collector that baked breads and yeah. other stuff. I uh, was making a little list of ideas, but not of ideas, but. We had a printing collective. There was the bookstore on DuPont Circle. The community uh, bookstore, right? Community bookstore. Yes. There were free schools. There was a runaway house. Um, we called the whole thing the alternative community. Those projects that were ex particularly food related were part of what we called the Food Federation, which was just a federated group of these worker co-ops. Each one was run by the people that actually worked there. Stone Soup eventually had about 25 employees full time and we managed the store as a collective group. We had a meeting once a week with everybody um, and after every single shift in that store, once we learned about criticism, self-criticism, which was a kind of Marxist concept, mm -hmm. once we got into Marxism a little bit and we learned about that, after every single shift at that store, the, 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 the workers on that shift had to meet for a minimum of 15 minutes and discuss how the shift went and what each other, what we could have done better. This was a daily thing for three years and by the end that place just ran like a top. I mean, we were so in sync with each other through this very daily process of just 
criticizing our work, summing it up, criticizing each other. You know, we had this whole thing of like, it's, it's fine to criticize each other, we're just trying to get better. And so we developed this attitude of like, really being open, don't be defensive. Whatever I say, I'm just telling you what I'm thinking, let's talk about it. And it was really good. It, it worked good in that in, in that enterprise, and I, would, I think that's something I would take into the future uh, if I was an organizer today. There are ways to make worker co-ops be an alternative to corporations. I think they they work in a lot of places in the world, but even in this country, there's our worker co-ops here and there. But I think the thing has more of a future than maybe uh, just giving credit for. The criticism, self-criticism that you're talking about was, was also part of another reality that was going on about the same time in the same community. All these activists who had been, you know, doing things against the war were tired of doing stuff and not getting much results. So oh, well over 100 people signed up for some traditional Marxist intellectual study groups in those years. And you, there was one at Stone Soup and there was, what, nine or ten other groups and just studied all the classics, you know, Engels and Marx and Mao and all these things and, and had, they, were, they went on for quite a long time, two, I mean two or three years, almost three like Stone Soup. Want to talk a little about that? Yeah, I, I really uh, appreciate the, the study group period. Uh, most of us were just like me, we didn't know anything about Marxism before the anti-war movement blew mm -hmm. up and then we were protesting and they started calling us communists or something, you know, it was a common thing. And of course you weren't a communist, you didn't even know anything about communism. Mm -hmm. So um, some people, and I really don't know who was behind getting this study you know, started. It was, a bunch of, it was a bunch of people older than us, our parents' generation, uh, who were communists in the 30s and 40s. There was a lot of them in Washington, D.C., yeah. um, the Electrical Union, a whole bunch of others. And they raised the Red Diaper Babies, who were our generation, and the Red Diaper Babies actually put together the study groups. They were familiar with the ideology. Um, and so, we, you know, it was a really interesting, even in retrospect, it's an interesting thing, because what... <laughs> It put us in history in some sort of way. Once you realize the whole Marxist explanation of history, which may or may not be true, but once you, you, you recognize that you could say, oh, this is what's going on. This is what's behind it all. We understand it's not individual things. It's, it's one large thing. It's so, systemic. It has, yeah, it's systemic. That's the word for it. But they were good. They were good for that, and yeah. I agree. And. Uh, because before then, you just had your feelings of dissatisfaction with certain aspects of the system, but you didn't really know it was quite a system. And then mm -hmm. Marxism really gave you a way to look at it and say, yeah, this is how yeah. it works. And one thing in particular it talked about was, um, you know, how the people, the class of people in this society that have the most money mm -hmm. are going to have the most influence in politics as long as the system works the mm -hmm. way Mm -hmm. It works, you know, and, and so you began to think of it in class terms. For the, for me, it was for the first time beginning to. I had been a. Re, I had declared myself a revolutionary two years before, or three years before mm -hmm. now, but I didn't. You know, I was just going to somehow be. It. You didn't know what to do. No, but now I had a framework, and you know, it was like, oh, it's the it's capitalism, it's the corporations. They're the ones, and they control the government because they can, and they want to have wars, and they want to do all this stuff. So. You know, I was beginning to become pretty systematic about that. And in Stone Soup, when we, uh, it wasn't that we studied together as a group. It was more like some, a couple people mm -hmm. were the first. They got into studying, they got into the study groups. Mm -hmm. I wasn't one of the first ones. Um, but then they told me, wow, this is blowing my mind. I'm starting to really, and so then I did it. And then after that, by then, you know, like six or seven of us in a and Stone Soup and the collective had been studying, had studied for a year or so in the study group, and we were saying, you know, we all need to do this. <laughs> yes. So then we made it a rule. Mm -hmm. If you're going to work here, you have to be, and you have to join one of the study groups. And I only lasted for one more year because after that we decided to abandon the whole project, which is another story. But um, we did for that year, every, you know, we basically raised it to the level of if we're going to work here together and we're going to try and change the world through our work, um, we need to study. You can't just be glib about that. You have mm -hmm. to study. And I think today's generations are a lot more educated mm -hmm. on this stuff than we were. We, I think we came from a fairly naive 
sheltered place in retrospect. Uh, and so it was crucial that we do some studying and looking into what other people in other countries are saying. I think today's young people maybe, it's always good to study this stuff, but I think young, today's young people maybe have more scope and perspective uh, than we did at that point in their lives. So what were your, what are your final lessons in life with Stone Soup and the study groups is sort of your background and uh, what have you been doing the last 20 or 30 years <laughs> since all this was going on? But first we want to hear about the demise. Okay, the yeah, demise. Yeah, yeah. Right? No, let's start with that. Yeah. Um, well, we were all studying. We were becoming pretty conscientious, like we are trying to make revolution here. We're not just like running a food store because we think it's fun or the community needs a food store. It really wasn't our motivation. I'm not saying those are bad motivations, especially the service one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, we weren't. We were young people then. We wanted to change the world. So we weren't satisfied to have a food co-op that works nicely uh, on 18th and S streets. So, uh, after a year of studying and talking and getting more and more serious about how are we really going to change the world, a bunch of us at Stone Sioux and in the study groups, it wasn't just the Stone Sioux, it was like all the young people. A lot of us were going, you know, we got to get organized and make a revolution. Like the way the Marxists said mm -hmm. you had to do. You had to have a political organization that was committed to the working class and all, all that kind of stuff. So um, some of us basically said, okay, we're going to commit to building that kind of an organization. And if we're going to do that, that's going to be full time. We can't really be worried about running a food store. And in fact, running a food store in D.C., in Bougie Town, in our view at that time, we need to go to a working class town. So a bunch of us decided, uh, really, we should wrap up Stone Soup. We should move to a place where there's real industrial workers, which in our case turned out to be Baltimore, uh, just up the road. But it's true, it was a heavily industrial city. Um, but we just decided, you know, we, we didn't want to do a utopian socialist project. We wanted to go out for so, socialist revolution. We want to go fight for it, do what the science seemed to be saying you had to do, which was build an organization for that. So if that's what had to be done, we were going to do that. So we decided to close the store, and we did, it closed up quick. I don't feel good about the way it ended. How did it end? It just ended because we all decided that we were moving on. And a few people said, wait, this is a store here. We, and so we said, well, if you want to take it over, fine. I mean, it's a nonprofit. Get, you, get a group together and we'll give it to you, really. I mean, we don't have any stake in it, really. We, we were going to close it down, but if you guys want to keep going. So well, how long did they keep going? I forgot. They did keep going, but I don't think it lasted very long because it would have been. I don't. I don't think they really had a fair chance to really make it work. We were on to. We were moving on. We weren't giving them like six months of transition or <laughs> anything like you would expect to take. So it was just one of those political things that young people, you know, we had figured out that that wasn't the answer anymore. Yeah. So we they were going to do this. So anyway, from there I just went, we went, a bunch of us moved to Baltimore. How many? Oh, maybe Numbers. a total of about 15 or 20, not all from Stone Soup, but from different alternative projects here in, this, in, the, in the city, metropolitan area. We went up there, we formed a little group of our own politically, and then we, at the same time, there were groups like this in all the cities around the country. It was called the New Communist Movement. Um, Groups that were realizing that we needed a new Communist Party. The old Communist Party was like back in the 30s, they did great, but they obviously weren't doing anything anymore, at least we felt. And meanwhile, China was like pumping a lot of their propaganda into the U.S., printing books. Mm -hmm. You could buy Chinese Marxist books. There's a bookstore in, yeah. on 18th Street, yep. sell them. We bought them, we read them. We agree with them, and so we moved to Baltimore to do it. And then, uh, I don't know if, if you all remember, um, there was one organization that came out of the, that time called the Communist Workers Party, CWP. CWP. And that's the group that I ended up eventually being part of. And in 1979 in Greensboro, North Carolina, there was an anti-Klan demonstration 
forming, and a Klan caravan came in and attacked the people before the march was, you know, just getting itself together, and ended up killing five members of the CWP, um, and wounding several others. And when you see the video, it was all video because the camera crews there because they were getting ready for a march of their own. And so uh, it's quite shocking when you see it on, on television, but at the time I was living in Baltimore, the murders happened. Um, the next weekend, the party called for a funeral march in Greensboro. Um, we all said we were going. North Carolina said, nobody's coming to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And you can't come, and they declared a state of emergency, but of course we all went anyway, getting in, into town and on back roads and various ways. And eventually we had a march there. It was a really rainy, gray day. It was, uh, I've never seen a day like that. They had police, uh, police and National Guard on both sides of the parade route, solid, basically keeping us in this thing. And they had military vehicles partying around. It was like quite intimidating thing. Uh, we weren't that intimidated. We were just going to march anyway. You want to stop what us? What kind of numbers are we talking mess. about? How many of There's about a thousand people in March. So a big day. group. Yeah. yeah, it was a good size. And march. what was the date? November 3rd. Well, the murders were on November 3rd. The march would have been... What year? 79. 79. Mm -hmm. um, the day after the Greensboro murders, uh, the Iranians took the hostages at the embassy in Tehran, which sort of pushed yeah. the Greensboro thing off the page. But for us as a party, it was a crucial moment because up until then, you know, we were pretty radical, leftist kind of action-oriented fight. You know, we were confronting the Klan. We were we were very fighting the power. Fighting the power. But uh, we talked a lot about what this meant, that they were, we were now seem to be under attack. It wasn't just the Klan. It turned out that the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and other government groups were also involved in the planning of this attack in Greensboro. And not, not the agencies, but their um, confidence. No, what do they call those? The right. people that infiltrate groups. Oh, and, yeah. Um, what do you call them? They report on other people, basically. Yeah, yeah they're undercover. Undercover okay. operatives okay. were involved in some of these planning. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they knew something was going to happen, but they didn't do anything. So anyway, we felt like, okay, this is a sign that you know we could be attacked in other places too. So what is going to be our tactics? So one idea was like, oh, we'll go underground. Uh, you know, we'll just like foment revolution underground or something like a weather underground yeah. thing or bombings or you know, you, you want to go that way. And we said, well, no, you're not going to win that way. So the only choice we really had was to like try and go more into the mainstream mm -hmm. and start taking our work out into wherever we could take it. Really, we had we started thinking of ourselves as eventually we were going to have millions of members in our party. We were going to be a mass party. So because a bunch of people from Ohio that we didn't know came to this funeral march mm -hmm. in Greensboro, given all the... Uh, state hostility to anyone coming to that thing. We were quite impressed that these people came. So the party wanted someone to go to Ohio and meet these people and follow up and see maybe they want to join the party too. So um, I ended up being the one that was asked to go out to Ohio to check up on these people, which I ended up doing. And then while I was out there, um, it turned out that people, yeah, they really liked what we had to say. They were like kind of socialist friendly and everything. But joining the Communist Party, I don't know, you know, you're going to have to work on me for a while. They weren't going to just sign right up just because they sent me out there. So eventually we summed up that if we were going to actually build a party in Ohio and be a mass party someday, we were going to have to go live there, get into the fabric of the community, spend time, do organizing. That's what I ended up doing. So my wife and I are moving out there. We spent eight years. In Ohio. Eight years in Ohio. Organizing and trying to build a party there. We built a pretty large group there, about 75 members, which I thought was good, but <laughs> when you think about it, it's nothing in the big yeah. picture thing. But, you know, we learned from that about party building. Eventually, in that same period while we we're still in Ohio as a party, we just summed up this isn't working. You know, you really can't build a mass communist party in America right now. Mm -hmm. 
and all of our efforts to try and keep ourselves together, what we're trying to do that is keeping us from doing that. You know, like those people aren't going to come to our things. If we're trying to go to all their stuff and be involved with them, we have to have a lot. Of, we can't be doing our thing. What are we even talking to each other for in a way? It, it, eventually we realize you, you can't orchestrate the revolution, so don't even try. Uh, so we just decided to abandon the party. Uh, so just, how are people supporting themselves? Um, well, all of us, most of us had jobs. The full-time uh -huh. people that were actually working for the party got paid by the party $200 a month. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that much. Well, tell, what was the industry that you were working with? Was it uh, in Ohio? Well, I had been in uh, nursing homes when I was in Baltimore trying yeah. to organize. Uh -huh. But when we went out to Ohio, I just, you know, had to get a job. To, my wife was getting the two hundred dollars, so I had to have a job to keep the family going. So I was lucky. I got a job at a, uh, um, a social service community-based social service agency mm -hmm. as a community organizer. It was a really great job. Oh. I ended up organizing low-income people on all kinds of issues. Mm -hmm. and it was it was good. It put me in touch with a lot of people. I learned a ton about organizing and all kinds of people. And the, the experiences from Stone Soup and then four years in Baltimore, eight years in Columbus, all is like a party or at least a conscious, F, conscious revolutionary actions. All that period. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make it work. Um, those were great learning years. I just learned so much about other people and the kinds of people and the things that people think about and what's moving them to do things or not. Uh, how you get, how you find people in motion and help amplify it, how you can't make things happen just because you want it to happen. It's just a, a million things about organizing that I learned. And so that after we decided to ban the party, then it was just like, okay, the party's last message to us all was like, go into the mainstream, take your values there, try and influence people, keep pushing for a better vision, and maybe someday we'll get back together or something. Mm -hmm. Or it'll come back somehow. Of course. It was a great learning experience. It was a great learning experience. And how did you end up back in D.C.? Well, after, we get, after the party work was over, um, and we were thinking about what's our best paths to get into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. It turned out that uh, because of the way my wife's career path developed over the eight years, she started out as a full-time party organizer, but eventually she had to work too. Um, she ended up, her career path put her in touch with, she was uh, doing mar marketing community, mm -hmm. public relations for this firm. She just got a low-level job, but it worked out great because she was so good at it because we had been party organizers for years. So she was really good at making things happen in social yeah. marketing. And this firm worked on the Governor Celeste campaign, and then she got in with them. And So from there, she got a, a, a job here in D.C. with a, a political firm. Oh, so she, yeah, so she led us back to D.C., and then you know, the rest of the family followed. And then when I got back here, her job was really busy. I got a professional job too. We were trying to raise our kids, doing two professional jobs, and really quickly realized this isn't going to work. <laughs> so I went back and got my uh, master's degree in education at GW, and then I went into teaching just because it fit more with your kids' schedule to be a teacher. Yeah. And I taught for a few years, and then my wife was doing well enough with her job that we really didn't need me to keep teaching. And so that was good. I quit teaching for a few years and I did some intellectual work that I wanted to do in terms of selling up things and uh, write, do, do some writing. I like to write. And then in my last stint, I had, once we I had to get another job eventually, I, uh, guys are working for the Health and Safety Fund of the Laborers Union, oh, yeah. the construction union. And I was the editor of their health and safety magazine and their communications program online and print. And that was great. I love to write. I can listen. I can think. You're a thinker. And put it together. So it was a good job for me. And uh, that's pretty much. So you've where been, I got. you've continued writing and thinking all these years. Yeah. And, and working. Yeah, and uh, and really caring about socialism. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much because I really just want it to be socialism, but I just want us to be more of a social um. community rather than a corporatist 
community. I feel like the corporations are running everything for their reasons, and we're just not. I feel socialism is really anti-corporatism. Anti-what? Corporatism. Yeah. You know, like, like, let's be in charge of our lives instead of the corporations, which aren't even people. I mean, being in charge of our lives as people, it's, it's it's not good. So I think there's just. I'm so excited about AOC and yes. Bernie Sanders too, and like all the Democratic Socialists of America. I mean, are these, great. these people. I, you know, they're coming up right at the right time, um, mm -hmm. talking about socialism and it is the answer. And you see also all these young people, a whole new generation, they're not, they, they grew up after the Cold War. They don't even, they don't remember when socialism mm -hmm. was our big enemy and it was like an everyday bombardment of attacks on them. They, these kids didn't grow up with that. To them, socialism, you don't like socialism? Okay. Well, that's been uh, drummed into them. It's not like when it was with us. So I, I think the younger generation is ready, yeah. ready for some new thinking. And I, I, just, I just feel like um, this Green New Deal, uh -huh. Medicare for All, yeah. it's socialism. If you really do that, if you well, at the very least, it's social democracy. It could be socialism, social. But I, I mean, I, I mean, what's socialism? I'm just yeah. saying anti-corporate. Yeah. Because uh, I'm not. I don't think socialism is owning. All the means of production, like the Marxists used yeah. to say. I mean, I think that made sense back in the day. Mm -hmm. It's not, you don't own people's law firms and the kind of service industries that we have and, that are in our economy. The state can't take over and run those things. It's not a state run thing, but there needs to be, the state needs to exercise control over corporate power, mm -hmm. not the other way around. Otherwise, the people are, I mean, our planet is being destroyed and our future. Is being destroyed because corporations are just doing what corporations do, which is concentrate on making money. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. That's quite a story. Thank you, Steve. I'm glad you liked it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still you're still fighting the good fight. Yeah, trying to keep it going. Trying to keep it going. How about your kids? Are they any of them political? Oh, well, they're all political, but they have, you know, they have other career paths. Mm -hmm. You know, they're act Social media is a wonderful thing. And they're really active on social media with their circles. I like being on social media and mm -hmm. being active with my circles. And I guess that's what everybody is doing. And that's why you, mm -hmm. we're actually seeing change now. The social social mm -hmm. media is empowering mm -hmm. people who couldn't be heard before. And we're influenced. It turns out that we kind of all think more alike than we realize. And it's different than the way they are. And they're reinforced it, move in our direction. It's a good time. I'm very optimistic about That's good. the next period. Thank you. You're welcome. Steve, and happy birthday. Thank you very much. <laughs>